Good morning, everyone, and uh, a, a big welcome to this session on mainstreaming gender equality in trade facilitation. My name is Shamika Suleiman. I'm the director of the division on technology and logistics of UNCTAD, and it is my brilliant team that you see running around and getting things done here. Uh, so let me uh, start because we are a bit late. Let me just put some uh, context so that we kind of, uh, you know, we want to get a real recommendations. So we, I like to put the context of this discussion to you. While trade policies, procedures, and standards are the same for everyone, which we know, but we should not forget that their impact is not gender neutral. Women traders and SMEs, especially because women traders are mostly in SMEs, I think we heard this yesterday, and they already face barriers, you know, many more barriers before they get to the red tape. There are societal barriers, and there are barriers to raising funds, you know, going into a commercial bank and getting funds. And then, of course, you know, they face much more barriers with regard to red tape in dealing with uh, bureaucracies. So that's the, that's the reality out there. And now, if you let me put another point to you. It's the second point is that, you know, informal traders, you know, we have worked in Africa. When you go to the borders, you see the borders are full of informal traders crossing borders, and these are mostly women. And helping them to formalize trade through enhanced transparency and easier procedures is simply good economics because this would generate revenues for revenue authorities because much of the revenues in Africa and in many developing countries do come from trade, from uh, duties. So that's the second point I want to put to you. The third point I, I want to put to you is the research on women in economic policies, policy making, shows that women have a tendency to look at larger societal, socioeconomic issues when they, you know, make decisions. For example, it is being, it's being shown in uh, uh, research that the women seem to play a, a, a bigger role in validating the role of government as opposed to that the market will determine everything. And women are for women economy, economic policy makers are more for social protection, more for equal pay, for equal work, and so forth. So having women at the table making trade policy decisions and decisions with regard to trade facilitation is a good thing because you bring the women would bring the balance. So that's the three points I want to put you to see why women should be at the table. And let me give you a couple of numbers to say where women are because we, the women are far away from the table. Number one, our research at UNCTAD shows that the National Trade Facilitation Committees are not gender balanced bodies. Only 35% of members on NTSCs in Africa are female. Not only committees are not gender balanced, but they are usually chaired or co-chaired by men. And only 27% of the African NT NTSCs are led by women. So these are studies done by my colleagues. And also based on our own research, it also shows, also shows that the Lack of awareness on gender mainstreaming is a big issue. Gender mainstreaming is not relevant at this point. Some of the participants are in the uh, members are telling us 33%. But the answers are, you know, it's not as relevant at this stage. And 23% of participants that took this survey also have said that gender mainstreaming is not a priority. So these are what's coming out of this time. So I just are emerging as a good practice. I think this is how we hear by sitting here for the last two days because the, through NTFCs you have managed to bring together an uh, entire governmental structures because this is, a, this is not an easy thing to do. All these ministries that are working as silos have been brought together, so this is a very big um, endeavor that you have done. So now the next step could be the NTFC could be the champion for gender mainstreaming. So the session today is to try to see how we can do it. So we have a very distinguished panel here. And let me introduce one by one, and then we will get to the crux of this thing. But I also would like you to participate, but you have to, because we, I have, we have a lot of restrictions for speakers, so 
no re restrictions on YouTube. When you ask questions, then, uh, you know, to be brief. So I have on my left, Ms. Dorothy Tembo. Dorothy, you know, all, or you all know, she's the Deputy Executive Director of ITC. Uh, since uh, 2014, as Zambian national, she has 30 years experience in trade and development. Ms. Tembo served previously as Executive Director of the multi-donor funded EIF, which is the Enhanced Integrated Framework Program, based at the WTO from 2008 to 2013. And during her tenure, she spearheaded the relaunch of the program supporting at the time 48 LDCs in addressing their trade-related technical assistance and supply constraints. And from 2004 to 2008, Dorothy also served as Chief Trade Negotiator and Director of Foreign Trade in the Ministry of Commerce, Trade and Industry of Zambia. Welcome, Dorothy, to this session. And then I am moving to my right. I have Ms. Estelle Igwe. Estelle is the Vice Chair of the United Nations Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business. We call it UNC PAC since 2014. She's in charge of the International Trade Procedures Program Development Area. So this is really a place that you should be sitting with us. And she's the Deputy Director with the Nigerian Export Promotion Council, NEPC. She currently heads the Trade Information Department of the agency and has 27 years experience as a Trade Promotion Officer. Estelle has also previously served at ECOWAS and also at the Nigerian Committee on Trade Procedures. Welcome, Estelle. And I have on my further right, Ms. Quera Stella M. Kifuse. She's the Executive Officer of the Customs, of, uh, Executive Officer of Customs of the Uganda Revenue Authority. She previously worked as the Head of the Computer Studies at the Kampala Parent School and as, as IT System Supervisor with the Centenary Rural Development Bank and as a Digital Forensics Analyst with Tax Investigations Department of the Uganda Revenue Authority and currently serves as the Acting Supervisor Customs for the Executive Office. Over her nine years of service as the Uganda Revenue Authority, she chaired the Departmental Innovations Committee, spearheaded implementation of the Business Unusual Campaign, and was the Director for Research in, in the URA Staff Council. And she has done a lot for women too, following her mother's uh, footsteps. And she leads, in fact, the team implementing the Women Traders Trade Facilitation Initiative in Customs Uganda that is facilitating women in trade. So, Puera, a big welcome to you. So to my further left, I have Ms. Joanna Thornstrom, and she's the Assistant Program Manager of the WCO, World Customs Organization. Uh, Ms. Thornstrom has worked at the WCO since February 2016 on the HMRC WCO UNCTAD program, and is currently Assistant Program Manager. Before joining the WCO, she worked four years as a policy officer in charge of gender equality at the Council of European Municipalities and Regions in Brussels and as an intern at UNESCO at, and the French Red Cross in Paris. So Joanna, welcome to the session and you also have you know, very relevant experience to this session. So let me now get to the, to the other session. So the first question we want to ask from all the panelists, but to have asked them very quickly, because is what, that, what in their views that they see as challenges in mainstreaming gender in trade-related policies, because you come from doing trade-related policies, you have worked in gender. So let me hear from you, what are the challenges in mainstreaming gender? But then I would also turn to you, and I would like to get some of your opinions but I also want to make these uh, challenges short because we know we enormous challenges and once we get talking about challenges, we will go on talking about challenges because we also want to get to the recommendations. So let me start from my far right.
Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here and to speak in front of all of you. Um, I thank God that we are well and we are here to speak. Well, um, what I think is a challenge for us developing countries and LDCs is the nature of traders. If I talk about one of um, a category that we have in Uganda, we have women who ferry maybe oil across the border. Every two hours, they are carrying a jerry can. So you have women who are dealing in informal trade. The nature and character of their trade is informal, and therefore there is no data that's collected relating to their businesses. So it makes it very difficult for policymakers to know the, the quantity of, of, of products they're dealing in, the nature. You know, so that, uh, that is one of the reasons I believe that um, it's a challenge for policymakers to mainstream gender. Um, this also makes it impossible for financing because you don't know, you don't really have data on, on the women. The second reason, uh, the second challenge is a cultural challenge. Cultural beliefs and practices in most of our communities, women are seen as people who belong in the kitchen. So it's very difficult, it's very difficult for the policy makers to think otherwise unless we make a deliberate effort. So that attitude that remains that women are supposed to play a key role in the home is one of the issues I would, I would think about. Um, some communities still perceive women as assets that should stay at home. They shouldn't own property and yet this property is the security for loans and financing. Um, policy makers, like she said earlier, are mostly men. So it's difficult for men to contextualize the challenges of women. You find a woman in a saloon is carrying the baby, in a shop is carrying the baby while they're doing their business. So how can a man remember that while they're doing um, a saloon, while they're constructing a saloon, they need to put a baby center for the women? So the fact that the policymakers are also men makes it difficult for them to contextualize the women. I also think that the fact that women are not homogeneous. They are different. Our cultures are different, our perceptions are different, and all these are affected by um, levels of education, levels of development, geographical location. It makes it difficult for anyone to plan for us or to plan for the woman in our roots. And if you look at the woman in the village compared to the woman in town, their circumstances vary. So it's a bit difficult for someone to come up with a one size fits all policy like someone mentioned also earlier. You can't plan for everyone and make one general policy. Um, the fourth reason, the fourth challenge I would probably mention is um, lack of role models. Most times, um, those small traders are not even aware that they can, like the, the woman I gave, example I gave a, a person who ferries oil every day for two hours, does not know that if your products are below $100, you're not supposed to pay tax. You know, when women make it big, they don't remember to go back to the grassroots to call on their colleagues to come up with them. We forget where we came from. So those are the four challenges I'd like to cite. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. These are very insightful uh, points that you raised. Let me get to Esther. Thank you very much, Samika. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank um, Oxford for this forum and its partners, and I'm coming from one of the partners. Uh, it's a privilege to interact with you. I want to thank um, Shamika also for this um, question because um, the challenges, we really need to know about them. If we don't know about the challenges, we won't be able to tackle them. So thank you for raising this point. I want to say that um, challenges and in maintaining gender into trade facilitation is multifaceted. And I will just look at it briefly from four perspectives. And the first perspective I want to look at is the policy and legal issues. When you look at that, you see that there are inequalities in several areas. One, in registration of businesses. 
you know, I'm, I'm glad this forum is for Africa, and so we know, I'm sure it's the same thing in all the countries. Women have more problems registering their businesses because of the conditions that are in place for registration. Um, another aspect I want to look at from in this, um, under this section is traveling outside a country. Due to cultural barriers, you, you heard the last speaker talk about cultural barriers. This affects also traveling. And uh, in our country, you see there are big cities, there are villages, smaller towns, and so on. And at times for certain businesses, especially for the big businesses, you just have to move, you know, to maybe a bigger town or to the city. And women in some cultures still have to take permission from their husbands, uh, from their parents, their father, or from even elder brother to be able to move. This is a barrier. And inheriting and owning land or assets, that is actually a major, major issue, especially in Africa. Opening of a bank account, this is even similar to that of traveling outside the country because the women still have to take uh, permission, uh, have shorties, and these shorties have to be men, either their husbands or uh, a, a male somewhere. And then policy makers do not understand the place of women in the economy. Women play a major role in the economy. It has just been emphasized that they, they are in the lower rung. But because of their impact, the impact they can make in the economy, the policy makers need to understand this so that we can you know, elevate the women and raise them to a higher pedestal. The second aspect I want to look at is the institutional aspect, uh, which has been mentioned briefly also, lack of representation in public institutions related to trade. I'm not going to go into details because you will hear that, you know, one is barrier to addressing discrimination, and the other is the limit of ability to design policies that address gender gaps. You know, there are lots of gaps, and uh, from the institutional uh, perspective, there is need to address these gaps. Then lack of coordination between various policy perspectives. This is very critical to reducing trade barriers for women. The third aspect I want to look at is the financial aspect. This is also very crucial. Discrimination in access to finance. We have limited access to loans, which restricts the growth of women-owned firms. You have financial obstacles during the startup processes and while running their businesses. And also in rural, often non-existing uh, banking infrastructure. You know, if, if the woman is in a rural setting, and in most of our rural settings, we don't have uh, financial infra infrastructure, we don't have the banks. This is a setback. And then the fourth aspect, the fourth dimension I want to look at this, uh, uh, this issue is information and skills development. You will all agree with me in our different localities that women have limited access to ICT. And also the, the low level of education and high illiteracy amongst women contributes so much to them making progress in trade-related in trade, uh, trade, uh, issues, especially in international trade. And also scarcity of data on gender in trade facilitation. This is a major issue and uh, I'm glad institutions are now working uh, towards, uh, like we just heard from UNCTAD, ICC, and so on. We are trying to collect data in this aspect. I'd like to rest my case here. Thank you. I think you're resting a very strong case, Esther. Now let me turn to Dorothy, because you have lots of experience really working with uh, small enterprises. Dorothy, tell us what are the big challenges. Thank, thank you very much, um, Tamika, and uh, I thank you for having invited us to be part of this conversation this morning. Um, I think 
much of what I would have said has actually been very well articulated by the two previous contributors to, to, to the conversation. But perhaps to try and put it, uh, to bring in a bit more context on why we should be having this conversation from a business perspective, I thought you, we should share with you what it is that we have found from the work that we are doing with the different businesses. First and foremost, I, I would say achieving gender equality in every domain is imperative for safeguarding human rights and promoting sustainable development. That's the reality of what we are, we are dealing with. 50% of the population, the global population are women. It gives us the justification to really be before you this morning and be pushing forward ways and means of trying to find solutions that actually better integrate women into the multilateral trading system. But specific to, to trade, what we have observed is that when we have women-owned enterprises, they can be a more effective driver for economic inclusion of women across developing countries. Exporting firms generally employ a significantly higher share of women than non-exporters. The second point we have established is that women-owned enterprises employ more women than the average exporting firm. In 40% of women-owned firms, the majority of employees are female compared to 22% in male-owned and managed firms. Data from ITC shows that female share of employment in firms owned by women and trade globally is as high as 66% compared to 39% for firms trading in the home region. Ownership also has an effect on women in senior positions. While only 10% of men-owned small and medium enterprises have women in their senior management, almost 85% of women-owned SMEs have female chief executives, chief operating, and chief financial officers. Fourth point is that evidence shows that women wages increase relative to men when employed in export businesses. And final point, enabling women to participate in trade and improving the performance of SMEs can translate into increased trade, productivity, competitiveness, driving overall economic expansion, job innovation, and indeed contributing to poverty reduction. So these are facts that we have established from the work that we have been doing and indeed from the research that accompanies that. But I think much of the challenges that have been laid out by um, my, my colleagues who have spoken before me is very much in line with the common thread that we have established from our perspective. I think the first point there perhaps which I would add to some of what has already been said is that by nature, gender mainstreaming is cross-cutting. And when you have a cross-cutting process, you, you, you have issues of turf, issues because of the turf, the programming becomes a challenge, the implementation becomes a challenge, and monitoring becomes a challenge. And this, we have observed, is not only at the country level. This also tends to happen even within the regional institutions that we are talking to. I give a specific example in the case of sea trade initiative which is all about women empowerment. When we try to have a conversation around the seven principal areas which I will share with you later on in the conversation, it is very clear to us that entities at country level see themselves as the implementers and not really as the coordinators of a holistic approach or intervention that would result in, an I in, in having impactful results. I think the cultural biases is another issue and already spoken to. Lack of information, specifically gender disaggregated data and awareness. Information is power. Unless you know what you're dealing with, there's no way you can come back to uh, make informed decisions or indeed be very decisive in terms of the action that is required going forward. Uh, the representation aspects, I think, are. Uh, uh, one of the issues that we have established within the broad spectrum of countries that we we are working we are working with, I think there it's very clear to us the trade policy discussions oftentimes don't include women, and where they are included, I I hesitate to say this, but I think I should say it. where they are included, perhaps 
the capacity is very limited in terms of the understanding of the issues, for them to be able to articulate the issues as they should be for the appropriate actions to be taken. I also wanted perhaps to say in this respect that it is very positive that we have the uh, trade institutions, trade and investment institutions supporting uh, all the chambers who sit on these entities. But I think it's equally important that the representation is elevated to have practicing business people sitting around the table to be able to engage in that conversation. So having beyond the chambers would be very useful. Final point, I think, relates to the will to translate the political willingness or the political signal that is given on gender mainstreaming into an operational aspect. I think that that is something that has to come forward. Perhaps I would uh, um, end by saying the categorization is a real issue. We have to ensure that we are not only responding to the informals, we are not only responding to those that produce, we are not only responding to those that are export ready, but that we are in responding also providing solutions that are customized to respond to the needs of the specific categories of women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy, and, and thank you also bringing uh, real data from real uh, numbers uh, to bear upon this discussion. I think this is something that Stella was raising. If you don't have data, it's very difficult to make a case. If I then the disaggregated data, we need evidence to make a case to finance ministries and so forth. They're full of men anyway. Uh, <laughs> so let me now uh, turn to Joanna. Please, Joanna, tell us what are the barriers that you have encountered in your own work. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I also want to take the opportunity to thank Angstad for uh, introducing this topic on the, this forum agenda. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. So, uh, talking about the challenges, uh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, there has been a lack of awareness and uh, a lack of knowledge on the important link between gender equality and trade. And I don't think this is an issue that is only concerning developing countries, but I think it's worldwide. And uh, we see only in recent years that uh, this topic is being discussed on the international policy agenda and in international forums just like this one. And it's only in recent years that we see that countries are actually discussing including gender-specific chapters in trade agreements, which is the case with Canada and Chile, for instance. Uh, I also know that the European par Parliament uh, they launched a report in the beginning of the, uh, they launched a report in March this year uh, where they emphasized the importance of including gender equality in trade agreements. Um, it was also uh, last year that the WTO adopted the Buenos Aires Jones Declaration on Trade for Women's Economic Empowerment. So it is very promising to see that this topic is being discussed more and more on the international policy agenda, that there is an increased awareness. So I think for the future, this is very promising. Uh, from a customs perspective, we try to promote an improved collaboration between the private sector, uh, and especially to include uh, uh, women trade or, uh, associations in these conversations. And uh, this is just uh, to, first of all, for custom to better adapt our services according to the needs of the traders. And on the other hand, as well, to ensure that traders are informed about their rights and procedures to ensure the levels of compliance. Um, that, that is, however, a challenge in many developing countries because, as uh, the speakers have already raised, a lot of the trade that is uh, conducted by women is in fact small scale informal. So, and often these women traders that are, they are not organized. So that makes it very difficult for customs to reach out to them. Um, the need for data, it has already been addressed, so I'm not gonna repeat it, but indeed it is a challenge. 
And finally, I would actually add now, when sitting here, uh, it came to my mind, I think also worldwide it is the challenge to include more men in this discussion. <laughs> I find myself in many forums, in many conferences, and it's almost all women. <laughs> so I, I hope that next time when we organize this sort of panel, we will see more uh, male speakers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. The point well taken. So I'm asking the men to now speak up from the floor. Now tell us the challenges that you have seen in when you try to mainstream gender into trade facilitation and trade policy and so forth. I think I have a woman uh, there too, Daniela. But let me get some men, Daniela, first. Yeah, Comesa. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. And thank you, everyone. Yes, indeed, uh, gender uh, mainstreaming is uh, a ma the main challenge. I wanted to share with you that we developed a program on the, from the EDF 11 trade facilitation on small scale uh, trade. In that uh, envelope, we have a gender mainstreaming program. So, uh, one of the main uh, uh, pillars for that uh, envelope was gender mainstreaming. And uh, there is also a, 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 a a program which tries to capture trade statistics, gender, in gender uh, social uh, dimension, which including the social dimension with it, gender. So the people who went to collect uh, data, they came with an excuse to say it is too much to ask for uh, small scale traders at the border. So that they said, no, don't, we don't need to include the gender aspect of it. Better, we keep a separate trader profile. So that anyone who wants to see the, the gender aspect of the, the, the trader, they can go to the profile, but not the actual data collection. But the main purpose of that program was to capture the data, the life data, and the challenges of uh, women small scale traders. So it is really a challenge and you need to include every in, in every discussion the men because uh, in that case uh, the data collectors are almost all of them men. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dorothy, you want to jump in? You want to say? Let me take some more. I think I have Liberia there. Congo. So can I start with Liberia, please? Ghana. Oh, wow. The Ghana is very uh, insistent to speak, yeah. so let me get to, can I start with Liberia first, and we'll get to Ghana. Liberia, please go Okay. Ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robert Mama B. Saspino, and uh, interestingly, I want to say thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for giving me the floor. My, one of my points that I had, your, one of your speakers already spoke on that. That has to do with we speaking on this topic, and I've seen so, so women up there, a lot of women with no men. So I mean, I was kind of a little bit confused. But I have already took it. Uh, Liberia experience, as you may be aware, we had two years uh, presidency given to women in Liberia, and our ex-president, Madam Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, did extremely well for women, but. One of the challenges that we experienced there was being pointed out by one of your speakers that has to do with role model. Most of the women in Liberia were given the opportunity and to get involved with even trading in other areas of life to improve their status, but then didn't return to where they came from in order to help other women out. That was one of the issues that we had. Many a times we have um, women meetings, and these are issues that are always being flagged out. 
And uh, um, one of your speakers spoke of women being discriminated when it comes to business registration. I just want you to go a bit specific because um, in Liberia, uh, significantly, women are improved to some area when it comes to trade, when it comes to business registration. And even as far as doing some business out uh, with other countries like China and other African countries, women are heavily involved and they have businesses that are registered and doing significantly well. Though, when it comes to the informal sector, yes, we have a lot of women who are involved with that sector in doing cross-border business trading. And that my recommendation, and we have been saying that even in Liberia, at the level of the NTFC, even at the level of customs, is to making sure that we create some level of awareness to make them understand that uh, no kind of informal trading wouldn't mean too well for them because it will improve their status from that level. It will lead to some level of improvement in our country. It will bring about some level of revenue generation, not only that, and also help themselves because, you know, when we improve trade facilitation, we also turn to improve investment. And that investment trigger down to the citizens' life being improved. So I think awareness will be one of the best recommendations that we can take into consideration. Lastly, one of the issues that we have in Liberia is the inability of women to avail themselves. I think that's why more women are left out when it comes to some areas of life, including trade facilitation also. More women don't want to avail themselves into other things to get going along with their male counterparts. I want to say thank you very much for giving me the floor, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liberia. I guess it's also a case where when the leadership at the highest level gets involved, you know, things move. So thank you for uh, highlighting a good practice. So let me move to DRC and then to Ghana and to Germany. Please, DRC, go ahead. Uh, merci, Madame la Modératrice. Et je tiens à remercier aussi toutes les participantes pour leur intervention. Euh, je suis Mme Bati euh, du secteur privé. J'aimerais faire part d'une expérience euh, spécifique que la structure que je représente aujourd'hui a eu à faire. Euh, cela fait plus de 4 ans ou 5 ans que nous nous sommes intéressés à l'aspect genre. Il y a eu une enquête, comme je l'ai dit la fois dernière, une enquête qui avait été menée au niveau de Finscorp sur l'inclusion financière. Et il s'est avéré que ce sont les femmes qui détiennent qui, où les flux monétaires passent plus par les femmes que par les niveaux, au niveau institutionnel, ou les banques, ou les niveaux formalisés. Alors, notre défi était celle de sensibiliser ces femmes. Bon, il y a aspect euh, informel et formel. Pour les formels, ce sont celles qui font plus euh, des voyages, les importations. On, on tient compte qu'il y a essentiellement assez de femmes qui sont dans l'importation, dans l'import-export, qui vont vers la Chine et d'autres pays. Euh, euh, pour euh, apporter des marchandises. Alors, il était question de les sensibiliser aussi et c'est de les euh, euh, formaliser sur certains aspects liés au commerce, sur la facilitation des échanges, c'est ce que nous faisons encore sur terrain. Et pour l'aspect informel, nous avons eu l'appui euh, de la BAD et qu'est-ce que nous avions fait Les femmes, surtout rurales, euh, elles sont plus dans l'agriculture et les flux de commerce transfrontalier que ces femmes font euh, si on le voit en termes individuels des femmes, on sent que c'est insignifiant. Mais en tenant compte de l'aspect de commerce transfrontalier, les, ces femmes font des mouvements, des va-et-vient d'un pays à un autre, surtout à l'est du pays, et c'est d'une manière essentielle. On sent qu'il y a un flux essentiel, mais qui n'est pas canalisé. Pourquoi Parce qu'elles ne sont pas répertoriées. Alors, nous, ce qu'on fait, nous les formalisons, nous essayons de les recenser, et nous saluons déjà, il y a une avancée au niveau étatique, il y a le code de la famille qui avait été changé il y a deux ans de cela, où il y avait, on, on nécessitait qu'il y ait l'autorisation maritale, euh, où même elle n'avait pas euh, l'opportunité d'appartenir ou de détenir des terres, euh, surtout au milieu euh, rural. Euh, il y a eu l'avancée, le code a été changé, modifié, et nous sensibilisons en fonction de ce code. 
Et ce que nous faisons actuellement aussi, c'est avec le financement, on essaye de les formaliser. Donc, certaines femmes sont maintenant réunies en groupement d'intérêt économique et elles essayent quand même d'accroître de, 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 leurs revenus et... Ce qui est sûr, les défis restent encore majeurs parce que c'est insignifiant. Pour l'association que nous sommes, les moyens sont toujours encore limités. C'est insignifiant. Certes, elles ont cette volonté euh, d'accroître de, 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 les revenus. Elles ont cette volonté pour euh, 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 intégrer d'autres aspects euh, euh, de, de, dans le commerce. Mais les défis restent vraiment majeurs, surtout côté formation et information. Beaucoup de femmes au niveau rural, même au niveau du commerce, sont ignorantes de ce qu'elles font elles-mêmes déjà. Donc, euh, j'aimerais vraiment, si euh, vous ne voulez pas tenir au développement qui sommes là, euh, qui êtes là, euh, de penser à comment euh, doter des moyens, même aux organismes des femmes qui essaient de les formaliser, mais à une échelle euh, limitée, d'essayer de les renforcer afin que ces, euh, ces formations soient plus élargie et plus étendue. Donc, nous remercions la base qui a essayé de nous financer certaines femmes qui, par exemple, pouvaient produire de jus de fruits naturels, mais à un niveau limité, aujourd'hui, elles sont euh, euh, détentrices de, de machines un peu modernes et on essaie de les former et d'avancer cela. Donc, merci. Wrap up quickly because the important part is the second part. So please, Ghana, let's tell us when you try to mainstream gender into trade policy and trade facilitation, what obstacles you face. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess historically, within the African setting, trade has always been the domain for women, both informal and formal. Um, so, but the argument against um, the access to credit for women. Uh, a lot has to do with uh, the buyer stores, the buyers against the girl-child education. We have more men being well-educated, and the process in accessing credit involves uh, the client being well-educated and knowing what he needs to do with the funds. Um, when it comes to trade facilitation, the bit about transport and what happens at the port definitely have a lot of men involved in that aspect. But the main beneficiary of the TFA, looking at the number of people involved in trade, are women. So what I would suggest, with countries that have gender ministries, do we suggest that the ministry has a rep on the committee, or we look at the various uh, business wing of the various chambers of, uh, of commerce, nominating somebody to serve on the NTSC? So that at least they have a voice at the policy level. That's why I suggest. Thank you very much. That's, that's a brilliant recommendation. So let me go to Germany. I have my good friend uh, Daniela. She's done a lot of work on gender mainstreaming. Daniela, you have the floor. It's not working. Is it? Ah, there you go. Fighting the technologies. Yes, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Shamika. Yes, I'm obviously not a man, but uh, I'm head of trade, so in this function I will say something. It's uh, sort of sad that we still have to discuss about the relevance of female traders and their impact on trade. I thought in the year 2018 we would be past that point of trying to explain why it's important and get to the issue of how do we do it? And I think this will be in the second part, but also when you look at the challenges, and we are here at the Forum for National Trade Facilitation Committees, what are the challenges here when you talk about implementing the NTFCs? What type of data? Yes, I mean, we've, we've heard that a lot, and it's great, uh, Johanna mentioned it, that we have the, um, uh, the commitment of, of the relevance of trade and women, and I do see on a multilateral level it's, it, we're getting there, but I think we have to take it a step further on um, what does that mean exactly? What type of gender-sensitive data do we need to make a point, and what do the countries need to act 
on implementing women. We heard a little bit about um, uh, women's business associations. I think when we talk about private sector involvement, already at a very early stage, we have, when we do the NTFCs and the government does the NTFCs, they have to do a reach out, a, a strong reach out towards identifying who are the women's business networks, even if they're informal. Sometimes there are other groups. And here, I would ask the panel maybe on, and also Ongtad, and going deeper into concrete data, into concrete um, actions on maybe doing checklists. What do countries need to do when overcoming the hurdles? What are best practices? So here we have to get, we have to be better. We have to take action uh, and not, you know, remain um, being sorry that women aren't integrated enough. So, so let's take it a step further. That would be really great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we will get to that point soon, and I think it would be good at the end of the session we come up with like a few recommendations that the NTFC should take on board concretely as they go forward in order to mainstream gender into the, the, this committee. So let, I have the last question of Plambi, and then we will get to the recommendations. Please go ahead, Mani. I'm sorry, can you please, I think it's the lady back there, maybe Zimbabwe's, yes, please, yeah. Mic is not doing, turn the mic. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, talking about uh, trade facilitation uh, through a gender perspective, uh, yesterday we all agreed that uh, trade facilitation is quite is good, it's on complexity. And when we're now going to actually add uh, gender mainstreaming, we have to be alive to the fact that maybe what we desire to happen may not happen. Because at times the good intentions of actually uh, having gender mainstreamed may not actually uh, deliver the desired results. And the same with uh, the trade policies. Uh, for, for example, I'm going to pick an example of uh, trade uh, liberalization. We've seen research has actually proved that uh, in some cases, uh, trade liberalization is actually when they worsen the status of women because women uh, tend to become sources of uh, cheap labor, thereby actually enhancing uh, the, the gender inequality gap. Right. Uh, talking about uh, uh, statistics, I think it is very important for, for as, as a beginner to have uh, uh, sex disaggregated data to actually help analyze the impact of the intended policies, the impact of the intended uh, trade facilitation reforms, whether it's going to, how it's going to impact on women so as, so as to have them, so as to have the gender uh, gap reduced instead of maybe having, having the gender gap enhanced. Because I said earlier that at times the, result, the, the results which we expect may not necessarily be delivered in the absence of research uh, using sex disaggregated data. And then there are instances of uh, certain tax heads which have got challenges. Uh, most governments rely on um, raising uh, revenue through taxes. And when we look at VAT as a tax of, re of, of raising revenues, its impact on women, uh, it tends to be negative. VAT is actually an indirect tax based on consumption and not on income. And uh, most uh, people who consume the, the basic commodities where we usually find VAT are women. And as such, it actually makes women have a higher incidence or proportion of paying tax as compared to other, to their counterparts who are maybe in, who could be maybe in the wealthy income bracket. This is my contribution. Thank you very much. Let me, I think I have Uganda. Yes, please. Uganda, go ahead. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. I had given up, uh, but thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. Just thinking through one of the other challenges which I think we we need to appreciate in this conversation 
is the fact that there hasn't been a deliberative, a, a deliberate move by both the men and the women that are in authority to make sure that uh, they promote the women uh, in trade. It has to be deliberate. I know that uh, for the women that are up high there uh, in the <clears throat> social structure, must ensure that um, they go out of their way to encourage as many women as possible uh, to participate in, the, uh, uh, in trade. I believe that that is going to be very key. Um, and of course, on the side of the men, why it's uh, it has to be deliberate, I think if we bore a reef from here in Ethiopia, I'm told that uh, about 50% now of the uh, political leadership in cabinet are women. I believe that that has been a deliberate move, and I think it is something that needs to be done across Africa in order to see more women uh, in trade. Thank you. Thank you very much for the point. I think we are almost, these are good recommendations. We'll pick them up. I think we, I have a, yes, please. I can see your uh, uh, flag. Could you please identify yourself? And then I have another question from Niger. Yeah, Mali. Yes. Merci, Madame la Présidente, Madame la Modératrice. Et je remercie les dames pour la qualité de leurs interventions. En fait, c'est pour exposer l'expérience de mon pays en, en, en matière de, de parité homme-femme. Mon pays a déjà en 2015, au Mali, le Mali a adopté une loi relative au genre. Auparavant, il y a même une loi d'orientation agricole en 2000, qui a été votée en 2005, qu'on peut assimiler même au deal farmer aux États-Unis. Qui a, qui a réservé 15% des terres agricoles aux femmes. Et y a la, la, quand vous prenez le commerce même, le commerce informel est détenu majoritairement par les femmes. Il y a même, au niveau du ministère du commerce, il y a même un projet qui a existé depuis une dizaine d'années, que, que l'on appelle actuellement euh, projet, de, euh, pro, euh, profac, projet de formalisation du commerce de détail. Et, et, et ce projet-là a besoin même d'être financé des partenaires comme vous. Quand vous prenez aussi des domaines comme des produits qui ont des potentiels exportables comme les qualités, c'est des femmes qui sont dans la, dans la valorisation de ces produits dans, et dans la chaîne de production de ces produits et même dans l'exportation. Ces, ces produits, des produits comme les qualités, les qualités qui sont inscrites même dans l'éduc, l'éduc qui, qui est élaboré l'éthique diagnostique pour l'intégration du, euh, du commerce qui a été, que l'on a élaboré d'ailleurs en collaboration avec la CNICET. Donc c'est dire, dire que euh, au Mali on accorde beaucoup d'importance sur cette dimension. Et cette dimension doit être intégrée aussi. On va l'intégrer et, et intégrer déjà dans le commerce. Et c'est même naturel dans le commerce. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Yes, please go ahead. And I, I'll take that as the last query and because we want to move to the next session. Please go ahead. Niger. Merci, Madame la Modératrice. J'ai un petit commentaire à l'endroit des femmes. Mais avant de livrer mon commentaire, je voudrais d'abord dire que la participation de la femme au développement à travers le commerce n'est pas seulement un problème d'équité. Mais c'est surtout une nécessité quand on regarde la composante de la femme aujourd'hui dans la population de nos pays. Et cette participation ne sera possible que lorsque les femmes ont le sentiment que ce qu'elles font comme commerce est valorisé et reconnu. Et comment faire pour que ces femmes-là aient ce sentiment Moi, je pense que ça dépend de nous, les femmes, aujourd'hui qui sommes ici. Nous mettons ces femmes, nous mettons les filles et les garçons au monde et c'est dès le bas âge que nous devons, devons apprendre à ces filles qu'elles ont le même droit que les garçons et qu'elles donnent tout ce qu'elles font comme activité de la vie humaine. Et c'est ce qui va les permettre en grandissant de savoir qu'il n'y a pas une barrière pour ce qui concerne le commerce ou sur quoi que ce soit. 
Et j'aimerais finir, pour ne pas être long, par dire que c'est bien beau aujourd'hui de voir toutes des femmes sur la tribune, mais c'est aussi mieux de vous voir aujourd'hui sur le terrain pour expliquer à ces femmes leur devoir, pour qu'elles comprennent ce qui se passe et pour qu'elles comprennent quels textes sont pris pour, euh, sur le commerce et sur tout ce qui se passe. Merci. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. I think on this very uh, powerful statement, now I'm turning to Estelle on to the recommendation. Estelle, you, you wear many hats, the private sector, and you're also now with the UNC FACT vice chair. You also look at the standards. So, so tell me, how can international standards and recommendations be game changers in promoting women equality in trade facilitation? And put your private sector hat and tell us what we need to do more to get gen uh, women in NTFC. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been interesting listening to uh, the participants bring up more challenges, which uh, I hope we can even have some time to respond to some of them because I, some countries are really have really taken some of those challenges seriously. Um, for us at the UN CFAC and uh, generally at the UN ECE, we've taken this gender issue very seriously. And um, I would like to inform us all that um, in the last few years, the UN ECE has been working on this. I want to bring to our notice that the working party seat of the UNECE took this gender inequality issue seriously. And uh, only recently, just this month, a recommendation has been approved. The recommendation U was, was revised and has just been approved. Which this uh, recommendation is on gender responsive standards. And why is this? This is in recognition of the fact that gender responsive st standards development and implementation can act as powerful tools for gender equality and women empowerment. Hence, achievement of the SDG 5. And for me, in addition, it should be achieving SDG 1. Because the SDG 1 says we want to eradicate poverty, and SDG 5 says and gender, um, uh, empower gender. So this is really um, important. And also from the UN CFAS perspective, we took this challenge up and we worked on the project Women in Trade Facilitation, because the UN CFAS looks at trade from trade facilitation perspective. And um, Based on that project that we worked on, we came up with some recommendations, which I would like to inform um, this house. Remember that um, my first intervention, I said I looked at the issue from four different perspectives, and we have recommendations for each of the perspectives. So I will quickly go through them, because I know we are short of time. Uh, from the policy and legal aspect, we say we are recommending that policy makers to ensure equal opportunities and rights for everyone. There should be no discrimination. And then include gender aspects into the, into the scope of economic policies, trade policies, agreements, and so on. And then, uh, so even uh, take this further, uh, we have a recommendation, recommendation 42, because you see the data aspect keep coming up, popping up from every speaker. And so we have um, recommendation 42, which is um, a recommendation where we have plotted in uh, a clause in that recommendation saying that the UN CFAS is committed to ensuring that the gender dimension is reflected in norms, rules, procedures, and access to resources. And so 
We recommend that government and trade I, should be encouraged to promote equal opportunities for women and men within the scope of the activities of national trade facilitation bodies. UNEC is a UN super, we call it bodies. From OCTAD is the NTFC, which is you people, is the same thing, the same committee. So you people have to take this home, you know. Um, UN CFAS is specifically encouraging the collection, analysis, and monitoring of gender disaggregated data in order to better understand and support women's engagement in international trade and transport facilitation. This recommendation is therefore encouraging governments, business communities, development partners, international organizations, and other policymakers to follow this commitment to ensure inclusiveness of women. It would be nice for each and every one of us to have a copy of this recommendation and go to it it's, uh, and the UNEC site, it's recommendation 42. And um, going further to the other aspect, like the institutional aspect, we said there should be building social and economic networks. And then there should be cooperation with relevant authorities, especially the customs. You know, we've said that uh, women businesses informal across borders and so on. And you know, it's the customs that is more visible, or most visible at the, uh, at the borders, yes. So cooperation so that um, the women can be assisted. Most times, you know, the, the, the women have problems even crossing the border. And then the role of public and private sectors in this area cannot be overemphasized. And that's where you all come in. Uh, from the financial aspect, um, we, we, there should be elimination of disparity in transaction costs. In fact, if you go uh, into the white paper on women in trade facilitation, so much is out there. We cannot say everything here. And you see the disparities in several aspects of trade. So we said there should be elimination of disparity in transaction costs. You'll be surprised to know that um, women um, things are more expensive than male things. You know, you, you see, see such statistics. You, you may not agree with it here, but um, studies have been carried out, and that's what the result is. And so we say this should be eliminated. There should be um, equal access to markets and services. And then new financial products, you know, for women. And for example, in my country, some banks are already doing that. They've come up with specific uh, products tailored um, towards women so that women can have access to finance. And uh, also in my organization, um, the Export Promotion Council, we have a division dedicated to women. We call it uh, Women in Export. And so that um, special attention is given to women to build them up. Uh, we have special pro programs for them. We expose them, take them out for trade fairs, uh, exhibitions, and so on, fund by the government. So we are doing all that, you know, to promote women. So we recommend that, you know, countries and organizations should do similar things. And of course, we are in partnership with the ITC on the Key Trade Program, you know, which uh, very few countries now in Africa are part of that. So I encourage all of us, all the countries represented here, to be part of it. There's we are not only talking about this, but we are also showing example. And it will be interesting to inform you people that the UNEC, UNCFAS is not only talking about gender mainstreaming, but they are also put, putting it into practice. You know, right now, 43% of our global experts are women. And I think that's a, a little high figure compared to uh, figures we've been statistics we've been getting for other areas. And 
also staff of UNC fat, 60% of the staff are women. I think that's a good example, you know, and we could also replicate that in our various um, areas of um, businesses, uh, government establishments, and so on. I think in the course of questions and answers, I may contribute more to this. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. I would like all of you to get the recommendation 42 of UNC FAC. It's a very comprehensive recommendation. And then, uh, then the point is how do we take these recommendations forward? In many times we have recommendations, we have laws, regulations, it's just the next, how do we implement, how do we enforce? So this is something that we need to uh, work more and more. I think, Estelle, you mentioned the sheet trade. So let me turn to Dorothy now. Dorothy, tell us from your own experience of doing a lot of work, uh, ITC doing on the ground, does the private sector have a role on mainstreaming gender in trade facilitation reforms or is it just the business of the government? So that's the one. And then maybe I think we have a lot of questions about that we need to be very specific of what we are talking about. So here I would like to ask what are the specific trade facilitation policies that would uh, help women entrepreneurs? Dorothy, you had the floor. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. I, I, perhaps before I get to the specific question you posed to me, I wanted to address myself to some of the issues that have been raised. Um, listening to um, the very valuable contributions that have been received from the floor, I, I do appreciate the fact that there are many, many challenges that are, are facing uh, women in business. Um, but I also think it would be prudent of us to try and cluster, for lack of a better term, these issues to focus specifically on those that are trade facilitated and what accompanying reforms would be required. And then I would presume we would continue to have this conversation. The broader aspects that have been raised perhaps would be a conversation that we, we have beyond this, this, this panel. So I just wanted to, to highlight uh, that fact, otherwise we, we get involved in, you know, trying to respond to a broad spectrum of issues which perhaps uh, might not really focus us on some of the elements that have been uh, brought forward. And here I agree that uh, we need to move from knowing what the issues are into an implementation phase and what is it that can be done. And I wanted to, perhaps in responding to that, highlight that one has to look at what has happened, particularly in the context of Africa, as a process. I think we were all starting from zero, where you have people not knowing or not understanding the linkages between gender and trade. And therefore, the planning was done accordingly to what was being deemed appropriate at that time. We have moved to a phase where we had countries coming back and saying, what is it that we, we should do for us to be able to get to a point where we actually get into operationally gender, mainstreaming gender? And here I, I, I would refer perhaps to my previous experience where within the context of the enhanced integrated framework, we collaborated with ITC to come up with a specific tool that would enable uh, countries uh, undertake assessments and come up with strategies that were gender sensitive. And I think in this context we had a, a, a piloting phase with Uganda and a few other countries. But still, I mean, you are really speaking to uh, the trade constituency or the ministries of trade. The issues go way beyond the ministries of trade. And I think that that is where uh, structures such as the NTFC come in. How can you get that conversation to go beyond trade and make sure that everybody feels comfortable that this is about uh, working together and ensuring that the country's response is one that is holistic and comprehensive in nature and is able to have the expected uh, impact. So specifically, I would propose that for the NTFCs, they should be 
uh, concerted effort made to ensure that you bring the women on board, where the women are not involved. But I'll take it a little bit further. Bring people that can actually be able to articulate the issue. For those that are going to be assigned the implementation uh, responsibilities, ensure that you're bringing people that are able or have the authority to actually be able to take forward the recommendations. It does not help when you have an NTSP representative saying, I have to go and consult. Next week you meet. I did not manage to consult. It has to be taken to another level. So the level of seniority to be able to be decisive and follow through on the recommendations of the NTSP, I think, remains um, crucial. Second uh, point I wanted to, uh, to make. It is important that we try and consolidate what is already available. Within the context of the various regional negotiations, uh, negotiations that have taken place, I admittedly, perhaps in the initial phase, there was a lot of focus on the much larger business entities, and therefore, the trade agreements that were agreed to initially did not focus so much on the informal, uh, on the on the informal sector or the much smaller ones. But since then, there have been steps. If you look at Comesa, if you look at Sadiq, if you look at East African communities, ECOWAS, they all have simply what they are calling simplified trade regimes. I think the question that should be posed is whether these are adequate or they can be more simplified to make that transaction happen and to ensure that there is harmonization across the board. And this is where I would also see the continental free trade area efforts coming in, that you are looking at a REX plus type of arrangement, which adds value to what is already pertaining, because your starting base is what is already pertaining within the context of the, of the REX. And I'll give a, a, a quick example just to illustrate the point I'm trying to make. In EAC, I think the simplified trade regime looks at a threshold of $3,000, if I'm not mistaken. In, in, in Comesa, I stand to be corrected, that threshold stands at $2,000. So if somebody is moving products between these, I mean, there needs to be some kind of understanding. Otherwise, it becomes confusing, particularly for the small ones who are normally not very well informed um, and, you know, need to be uh, facilitated. Um, the next point I wanted to make, I think there's a need for us to find alternative ways of addressing the harassment that women face sometimes at the, at the border posts. And here, I'm, I must say, in, in border posts which are very uh, advanced in terms of technology, in terms of procedures, maybe you see a little bit less of this than in border posts where you have, which are very far from capital and perhaps limited in the infrastructure. The transparency in relation to the translation of the uh, provisions that are available is very much dependent on who attends to you. How do we minimize that corruption or that uh, prospect of somebody being tempted to, 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 to receive a bribe? Um, and I think this is part of what I, I wanted to perhaps come back on with respect to Comesa. I think right now Comesa has has a project ongoing under EU EDS 11 funding where they're actually focusing on uh, informal cross-border traders. And as a pilot, they're looking at five, um, five uh, border posts where IGC and IOM have come in to specifically look at this and try to see how they can improve the data. And my final point is the synergies within in-country and, of course, at the regional level. Regional level, you have, for instance, I come back again to Comesa, not by way of trying to pick on them, but because perhaps I understand that process a little bit better. We have that project ongoing. On the other hand, we have the gender with the 50, connecting 50 million women funded by the African Development Bank. How do we bring all this work to complement each other, to make it more facilitative uh, for women? So 
within the structures at national level, the, uh, the enhancement of the coordination, the participation of women in those uh, institutional structures we put in place, but also ensuring that this also comes through at the regional level. I will stop here, perhaps, and come back to the speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy, for very specific and uh, pragmatic steps that we can take forward in incorporating uh, gender mainstreaming in NTFCs. So now let me turn to uh, Joanna. Joanna, tell us, because you are a customs expert, and this is customs is normally a, a world of men, but I think it's changing. I have seen it's changing in Rwanda and Uganda and many places. But uh, what can customs do to foster gender-sensitive trade facilitation reform? And any, any inspiring story you can tell us? Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, uh, customs can, uh, in fact, promote gender equality in a number of ways. And uh, at the World Customs Organization, we promote among our members to address the topic of gender equality in a holistic way. So this means not only taking it into consideration is in its external policies, which include trade facilitation, but also in its internal policies. So that includes human resource management and leadership, for instance. And when it comes to trade facilitation, as uh, Mrs. Nagambi Tembo uh, rightly mentioned, there are several studies that shows that women traders and women-owned businesses, they face uh, many uh, additional challenges when it comes to trade. Uh, for instance, uh, they lack information about their rights and uh, uh, trade regulations and procedures. They uh, are often exposed to um, uh, additional difficulties including corruption and sexual harassment at the borders and therefore they are more sensible as well to the issue of safety at the borders. And uh, to overcome these barriers and promote gender equality, um, customs can do many things. So first of all, as I already mentioned, we recommend that customs consult more broadly with uh, external stakeholders, including women business associations, to make sure that they are informed about their needs. Uh, also through automating procedures as much as possible, this can uh, to a certain extent avoid integrity issues and also uh, ensure efficient use of technology. Um, when we talk about ensuring safety at the borders, there are many things that can be done. For instance, such an, uh, a simple thing as having sufficient lightning can actually uh, make a big difference for these uh, women traders. And also, it's very important to have these uh, type of 24 hours complaints mechanisms in place so that traders uh, can report incidents both of corruption uh, and uh, harassment. And also what has been already addressed, uh, simplified procedures for small enterprises and SMEs can, of course, uh, make uh, a lot for them to, to facilitate uh, as well. Uh, let me just mention as well, because customs are sometimes accused for, for this uh, sexual harassment and these type of incidents, and uh, it might be the case in many cases, of course, and we try to address this and make sure that customs are trained as well. But it can also, in fact, be the opposite direction, where customs officers that I have actually to talked to customs officers where this has been the case, they are being accused of sexual harassment. And for instance, even women smugglers can h say that uh, they will undress or, or similar things. So it's very important that customs officers are in fact uh, trained on these uh, uh, topics so that they can, they know how to react in these type of situations. So um, it's both ways in this, in the sense. And all of these recommendations that I just mentioned, they are part of the Gender Equality Organizational Assessment Tool, also known as the GEOAT. And this tool, uh, it was developed by the WCO in 2013, and it helps 
customs administrations to assess their own practices and procedures, to know uh, where they are in terms of gender equality, and also uh, how they can address gender equality issues in their different areas of competences. Uh, so uh, it covers areas such as recruitment, flexible working policies, um, leadership, uh, and how to uh, collaborate with external stakeholders at the border, for instance. And besides uh, the GOAT, the WCO is also currently developing a blended training package. And uh, this package is composed of, uh, on one hand, by a one-week workshop that is targeting senior and middle uh, officers. Uh, and it focuses on how to implement gender mainstreaming within customs administrations. And on the other hand, uh, this uh, training package, it also includes an e-learning model. Uh, and this e-learning model is currently under development. Uh, and we expect that it will be launched at our next capacity building committee in Brussels in April next year. And this model, it focuses on raising general awareness. Uh, and it, it targets all customs uh, officers. And we have developed it to make sure that it is very practical and it also highlights, uh, in fact, uh, the benefits for women as well as men on gender equality. So I think it's, it's very good. And uh, I have to say as well, because we have a representative here from uh, the Finland Eastern Southern Africa program too, so this blended training package, it is funded by this program through the uh, government of Finland. And Madam Chair, do you want me to comp continue with the examples of good practices? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so.